Very good. Welcome, everyone, to the colloquium. <clears throat> I'm thrilled to introduce you to, uh, to my friend and colleague, Saikat Guha. Um, you know, actually, I'm very excited that he accepted our invitation to come and speak with us today. Um, it, I'll have to say that the invitation was, was issued strategically while there was literally eight feet of snow outside of his door. So it was, uh, I think this was an attractive option for him in the middle of the winter. So Saikat um, is from India. He did his uh, bachelor's at IIT Kanpur. He did his PhD and master's both at, uh, at MIT. He graduated from MIT in 2008 and started working for uh, Raytheon BBN. And so you think, well, what, what would someone working in a company know about quantum optics? And it's actually quite remarkable that, uh, that while working at Raytheon BBN, he gets to do things like quantum information processing, quantum communications, um, network information theory, uh, quantum sensing. Uh, it sounds like a great job to me. And it's at Raytheon. If only we had some local Raytheon folks who, who did that kind of work. Wouldn't that be fun? We could, we could collaborate with them. Anyway, so I've, uh, I've known Psycat, I guess, for, since, about, uh, since 2010, when uh, he became a performer for a DARPA program called Information in a Photon. And, uh, and I was a little skeptical at the kickoff that, uh, that this company, which I didn't know much about, Raytheon BBN Technologies, uh, would have sort of the, the, the gusto to do what, what needed to be done in that DARPA program. And I was very pleasantly surprised. And in fact, uh, SciCat's reviews were one of the high points of my life at DARPA. So I'm, I'm really very happy to have him here talking to us about uh, quantum limits to reliable, secure, and covert optical communication. Thank you, Mark, for such a nice introduction. It was a pleasure working on the info program. Um, that, was the, that was the project that actually led, um, let me continue my PhD work that I did at MIT literally without any interruption into, into my career at BBN. So, um, so as, uh, thank you, Mark, for the invitation. It's, uh, it's great to be here. Um, as Mark said, I just came out of Boston, got between seven and eight feet of snow in the last three weeks. So it almost feels surreal to be out here in the middle of February. Uh, <laughs> in this weather. Um, so I, I will talk about optical communication. And um, my talk will be roughly split into three parts. Um, well, two parts and then the third small part. Um, the first, um, and in all of these, I'll be looking at uh, what quantum mechanics tells us about the ultimate limits um, to communicating with light reliably. And the second one, second part I'll look at what quantum mechanics tells you about communicating information with light securely, where you're secure to an arbitrarily powerful adversary that, that physics may allow. And then the last part I'll talk a little bit about are some of our recent work on what quantum mechanics tells you about how to communicate information reliably, but also undetectably, that you don't want the worst, worst possible adversary allowed by physics to be even able to tell that you're trying to communicate. And as you will see that each one of these tasks are, that will get progressively harder. And um, um, we'll see what the limits that physics imposes and how to, uh, how to achieve or how to get close to those limits. OK, so I'll start with a couple of slides on some very basic of, of quantum information. And then um, I'll, I'll get more into the details. So. Um, this is just uh, one slide on what a qubit is, or what quantum quantum information processing gets us um, um, to work with that classical information processing does not. So classical computers work with bits of information, zeros and ones, and uh, there, <coughs> um, roughly speaking, there are these three important things that quantum physics lets us play with that you don't get access to in classical information. So the first thing is being able to be in a superposition of a zero and a one. Okay, so the zero and a one, you can think of these as two orthogonal vectors. Okay, And uh, you can write down, this is a qubit state, and you can write down this as a superposition of any two orthogonal states in that span. Right? You can, you can define any two vectors that are mutually orthogonal, and you can express any vector in the span of those two as a superposition of those two vectors. Um, so that's a qubit. And the other thing is, as soon as you let yourself have a qubit, uh, if you know, if you know, with linear algebra, it's easy to see that you can allow what are called entangled states. You can have two qubits in a state such as this one, where uh, you are in the superposition of the first qubit being in a zero state and the second one being in a one state, and that the first 
being in a one state and the second one is being in a zero state. Okay. So this is a situation where you can't say that my first system is in this state and my second system is in that state. So they are in a joint state that, that only can be described by this entangled state, entangled state um, notation. The final thing is that quantum mechanics lets you to make quantum measurements. And a way to think of measurements is uh, being able to project uh, on one of these uh, two orthogonal bases. So you can pick any orthonormal basis and project your state onto that basis. Meaning that, say for instance, if I gave you a qubit that was prepared on the zero state and I measured in the zero one basis, then you are going to get the answer zero with certainty. Okay. But if I prepared a zero state and measured in the plus minus basis, then you are going to get one of the two answers with probability one half. And if your basis was rotated by some angle, then your probability of getting one of those two outcomes will be some p and one minus p, where p is the projection of your state onto the basis, right? So with these three things or, uh, with, um, under your belt, I mean, what, what kind of things can you do if you have access to arbitrary, really complex superposition, entanglement, and measurements? What can you do that you cannot do with classical computers? So this is just my way of thinking about it. There are different ways of classifying these, um, these applications. So in my mind, there are quantum information processing buys you applications that are roughly can be classified into two types. Right? One kind of applications is where um, you get processing speed up. Okay, you get better processing. Uh, a better processing could be either just to compute an algorithm, compute a, pro a problem where you are, say for instance, you're factoring a number. There's a quantum algorithm that lets you factor uh, with an exponential speed up over with the best known classical algorithm. Uh, in Mark's program, we looked at building optical receivers for optical classical communication. And you can think of that receiver as a special purpose quantum computer, so quantum processor, quantum limited processor, where you let yourself have all the access to quantum limited processing, measurement, and whatnot, and that's a special purpose processor that does that computation faster, right? And the other kind of um, application is where you get, you don't necessarily get a processing speed up, but you might be able to derive certain types of security features that you would not get otherwise using classical information processing. And under this category are applications such as um, privacy preserving protocols. Um, one example that I um, like to give in this, ex uh, in this category is um, what is called the symmetric private information retrieval problem. So imagine uh, you're, so you're looking up, you're searching on Google every day. So let's say that um, you did not want Google to find out what you just searched. Right? Um, but on the other hand, uh, you are willing to pay Google for every search you do. And uh, one, so one easy solution for that would be that for Google could hand you over this entire database you can go look for whatever you want to look for and give, 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 give them back the database. But then that, they, can't, they won't do that because they, it's, they, want, don't want, they don't want to give you access to the whole database, right? So there's a, there's a symmetric private, uh, privacy requirement on the two sides. And how do you solve this problem? So problems like this is where, again, there are quantum techniques or quantum, uh, quantum information driven techniques that can give you security features that you can't get otherwise. When I say can't get otherwise, there are classical algorithms that solve problems of this nature, but all those algorithms are only computationally secure. When I say computationally secure, meaning that the security is derived from the, from the hardness of certain computational problems. And if you can scrap those computational problems, you compromise the security. Whereas the security that you get from quantum information processing, they're physics-based security. It's a security that cannot be compromised by an arbitrary, arbitrarily powerful eavesdropping. And uh, <clears throat> quantum key distribution, which is a quite well-known application, does fall under this category, where two parties, Alice and Bob, separated by some optical channel, they can generate shared secret keys that are secret to an arbitrarily powerful eavesdropper. The way people do key distribution today in all your conventional computer systems is using an algorithm called the Diffie-Hellman algorithm. It's a very simple algorithm. Um, it, uh, you just, Alice and Bob, they just go through multiple rounds of public communication. They just shout at each other. And uh, at the end of the day, they can share a secret key. And the security of that algorithm rely, relies on this computational problem known as the discrete log problem. And there is a quantum algorithm that can crack the discrete log problem in polynomial time. So if somebody, someday somebody is able to build a quantum computer, then Diffie-Hellman would be insecure. 
whereas quantum key distribution will be even um, will be secure. So anyhow, so <clears throat> I'm going to focus my talk on today on um, three of these things. I'll talk about optical reliable communication, talk about optical receivers, work that was funded by the Info program. I'll talk a little bit about, about our recent work on quantum key distribution. This is work being done under the DARPA QNS program. And finally, I'll talk a little bit about uh, covert communication. OK, so uh, reliable communication. The, is the, my first topic is you want Alice to be able to send data reliably to Bob, while you want the eavesdropper uh, not to be able to decode the message. Um, oh, sorry, um, this is reliable communication. So it doesn't matter what the eaves does with the message. So you just want Alice to be able to transmit the data securely to Bob. Uh, secure communication is where you let Alice and Bob have a parallel channel, a classical channel on which they can communicate to each other. So you're allowing them a, an additional resource. On the other hand, you, you want the eavesdroppers. The eavesdropper, in this case, I'm just drawing it phenomenologically here, but um, when, you, when you have a noisy channel, the eavesdropper is the worst case adversary that can be consistent physically or mathematically with that description of that noisy channel. So it, is not a, it doesn't have to be a real eavesdropper sitting in the middle of the channel, but what you do is that you have a channel that has some loss and noise and whatnot. You attribute all of that loss and noise that is coming in the channel to be as if it is coming from this all-powerful adversary. Okay. And then for that all-powerful worst-case adversary, you figure out, is there a way to generate shared secret keys that is secure to that worst-case adversary? If it is secure to her, then it will be secure to any actual adversary who is causing that noise and loss, right? And you let Alice and Bob have this additional classical channel on which they can shout at each other. This is a public channel. Eavesdropper can hear that. So secure communication and key distribution, you, can, you kind of can go back and forth between them, right? Because if you have a secret key that you share, you can use the one-time pad cipher to add that to a message and make that secure. And you can send that message on this public channel. The eavesdropper won't be able to crack it. On the other hand, if you, have a, if you have a channel on which you can send secure data reliably, you can generate local random numbers at one end and send that securely. You'll have a shared secret key. So those two problems are, uh, you, can, you can go back and forth. Now, in the third case, uh, covert communication, we are going to allow another additional resource to Alice and Bob because it's a harder problem. Uh, Alice and Bob can have some pre-shared secret, perhaps using QKD previously, on, um, uh, which they now have access to. And now you want Bob to be able to decode Alice's message reliably, which is the case in all of these three. But now the eavesdropper must not be able to even detect the presence of the communication attempt of Alice. Okay. So that's the, those are the three topics that I'll talk about. And as I said, this work was funded by the DARPA info program that, um, that Mark ran when he was in DARPA. Um, and then uh, some of the secure comms work is being funded currently by the DARPA QNS program and the, uh, the ONR C key program, which is concurrent with the MURI program that Mark and some others here are involved in. And uh, this work is being uh, supported by an NSF grant that I have joined with UMass Amherst. Okay, so this is the outline of my talk. I will uh, first start with a quick background on quantum description of light, measurements, processes, and so forth. A very quick introduction, and please feel free to stop me anytime, ask me questions. And uh, then I'll talk about these three topics in sequence. All right, so um, here's a laser pulse, an electromagnetic pulse, E of RT, um, at some center wavelength, center frequency, omega naught. And uh, this, this complex, or this envelope sitting here, this, this uh, E of R is a real part of the, the field. This is just, there's a spatial and a temporal aspect to it. You can, uh, if you might be able to factor them, in which case there's a spatial mode and a temporal mode. And this is all classical electromagnetic theory. You can, let's imagine, let's say that you have a pulse that goes from zero to time t, and you have some aperture area um, r uh, that is inside this A uh, is your aperture area. Now, um, let's also assume that we express this field in um, normalized photon number units, meaning that if I look at the magnitude square integrated over the time interval and the area, the, the energy number that we get is in photon numbers. So n sub s is the mean number of photons in that pulse. Right? So I'm getting rid of the h bars and omegas from, from, from this description. OK? Now, um, so one could, so let's say you have a, so I'm going to assume monochromatic light throughout this talk, so let's not worry about the frequency domain, so you have just one center frequency. And information can be encoded by modulating either the phase or the intensity of light, so you have the phase over here and the mean photon number over here. Now, one could also potentially modulate the quantum state that this particular mode is excited in, and I'll come, to, come, come back to that later. But as far as classical electromagnetic theory is concerned, 
you have an electromagnetic mode, and then you can modulate the phase and the amplitude uh, of that mode to encode information. So this is just one slide on a free space optical channel. So you, I talked about a mode, okay? And uh, now let's see, in the context of a free space channel, how many modes do you have access to, okay? So I'm just showing here a aperture. Um, AT is a transmit aperture. This is a receive aperture. There's some free space range L between them. If you write the linear system input-output relationship, go through a normal mode decomposition, what you can show is that there's a bunch of orthogonal spatial modes of the inputs. So remember the spatial mode that I had over here. So R is a 2D coordinate, x comma y. Okay. So a bunch of spatial mode of the input, such that if you propagate one of those modes, it appears as a particular receiver aperture mode such that these input modes, they're orthogonal in the sense that if you integrate one, no, so integral of f1 of r, f2 of f2 star of r, it is zero, okay? That the modes are orthogonal in the receiver, and there are an infinite number of modes, right? But then if you plot there, the, the so I'm, here I'm plotting the transmissivity of each mode, meaning the fractional power that gets coupled into the corresponding modes. So if I put in power p into a particular mode, the mth mode, what fraction of that actually gets into its corresponding receiver pupil mode, okay? And when you plot them, what you see here is that on the x-axis, I have this number for d, which is the free space Fresnel number product. It's a product of the area of the transmitters and the receiver apertures and divided by lambda L squared. Lambda is the wavelength of the light. When this number d is much larger than 1, let's say it's around, uh, you know, this is in some normalized unit. When these, D is much larger than one, which is you are in the what is called the near field operating regime. In that regime, there are rough, roughly D spatial modes that carry almost unity power into the receiver aperture. Meaning if you are say operating over here, let's say over here, you have one, two, three, and four modes. So see that this is D equals to four. So if I draw a vertical line over here, there are four modes that have almost one transmissivity. And the higher order modes, their transmittivities go down very rapidly. Okay? On the other hand, when this number D is much smaller than 1, and when will D be smaller than 1? When your range is either high or you have very tiny apertures. You are in the far field regime. In that regime, when D is smaller than 1, there is basically just one spatial mode that couples any appreciable power from the input to the output. So even though you have an infinite number of these modes, you would just want to use one because the other higher order modes, they don't couple any power. Okay? So that gives you the spatial mode count. That is, let me call that M. And in light, you can use two polarizations. So you can have two extra modes for each one for each polarization. And if you, let's say, have W is your temporal bandwidth of your source, and T sub S is the symbol duration, transmit duration, then you have these many temporal modes, okay? these many temporal orthogonal signals that you can fit in. So let me call little n to be the total number of spatio-temporal polarization modes that you can use. One could do a similar calculation for a fiber channel or a waveguide channel, but this is a calculation for an optical channel. Okay? Now, after we have gone through all this physics, if you pull back for a little bit, and you can think of each one of these modes, you can think of them as parallel channels, kind of like you think about MIMO channels in radio. Okay? These are parallel channels in principle. Now, it might be very hard to actually generate these spatial modes and separate them at the receiver perfectly, but in principle, you have access to these many modes. And uh, each mode, transmission of each mode can be thought of as a beam splitter, okay? A beam splitter going from input to the output, and the, this is the transmissivity of that beam splitter. And this line, I'm just showing the zero just means that it's a vacuum state on the other port, meaning that there's no additional noise. You just have pure loss going from the input to the output. Okay, so that's enough for, um, for modes, okay? So now, uh, go back to that picture I showed previously about the optical pulse. So if you detect the energy of the pulse, uh, with a quantum limited energy measurement, it turns out that if you have, um, if you put that pulse into the detector, you will get a Poisson distributed clicks, meaning you will get k clicks in the detector with that distribution. Now, as you can see clearly, that number of clicks that you get has no information about that phase phi in the first slide I had, right? This one. It only has information about the mean photon number. Um, now, you... So, this is the... So, now, a quantum picture of a laser pulse in a given mode. So, now, I'm consider that mode and you have a laser pulse in that mode. So as I said, there were just two parameters, right? So there's ns and phi that you can modulate. So you can define an amp the amplitude of that pulse is square root of ns times e to the j phi, okay? So you can think of this alpha as a complex number in the phase space, right? And uh, 
the quantum picture of that of that coherent state is a superposition over what are called as number states. So these k vectors that you are seeing here, you can think of them as kind of like the qubits that I showed in my first slide. But except that now you have a, a complete orthonormal basis that is infinite in size. So you have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, up to infinite number of photons in principle. And you can think of a laser light pulse as a coherent superposition of all those photon number states. Okay, well and good. So this is your laser light pulse. But then as soon as you see this sort of a picture, you can imagine that immediately that quantum mechanics should allow you to have arbitrary superpositions of those Fox states, of those photon number states. And this is why I said in the, pre in the first slide is that not only can you modulate the phase and amplitude of the state, you can send arbitrary quantum states. You can modulate the quantum state that that particular optical mode is excited in. Okay? Um, and these mod CK squares, they just have to add up to one. So these are just probability amplitudes. All right, so now that's, that was energy measurements. And I said that energy measurement doesn't have any information about the phase. You can also do what is called coherent detection measurements. And there are two kinds of them. There is homodyne detection measurement and heterodyne detection measurement. So the picture I show here is that of a homodyne detection measurement where let's say you put in a coherent state alpha. Now I have a local oscillator laser, which is much stronger than this input. Um, that is, that has a phase offset theta from the input, and you, these two are energy measurement devices. So these two are same as the energy measurement device I showed, but now instead of directly measuring the energy of the input, you are first mixing the input with a strong local oscillator, which is also a laser light pulse, but local at the receiver, and then you measure the two outputs with the, with the energy measurement devices. Take the photocurrents of the two detectors, you subtract them, you amplify them, so this is just a difference amplifier, and then <clears throat> after that you do an integration over the, over the pulse duration. After you go through all the math, you'll see that in, in the limit that this local oscillator is strong as compared to this input, that your output is just a Gaussian distributed variable with a mean that is the real part of alpha e to the j theta and a variance of one quarter. Okay, And uh, there's a, after this point you could have, if you just change the circuit just a little bit, Whereas instead of doing the detection here, the local oscillator, so here the local oscillator frequency was exactly the same as the frequency of the input. But if you use the local oscillator frequency to be slightly offset from the input wave frequency, and then you have these uh, co cosine and sine correlators and you do the integration over here, you now get two outputs, two real outputs. Both of those two real outputs now have, access, have information about the, about the amplitude, but you are now measuring two quadratures of that, co of that complex number simultaneously. So that alpha, remember in the complex space, you're now measuring both the real and imaginary part of alpha. In fact, you can measure that alpha in any rotated basis, the real and the imaginary part of that alpha. All you'll have to do is to change this theta, which is the local oscillator phase. But as you notice that you are now giving up on the noise, you're making two measurements, so you get twice as much variance on both. Okay. So these three are roughly speaking the three standard ways of detecting light that we, that we use in the labs today. And uh, now just as an exercise, you can quickly take a look here. Um, so for communication purposes, one could use different types of what are called modulation formats. Right? You could on off keying modulation where you encode information using either the vacuum state or a coherent state. If you use an on off keying modulation, which one of these three measurements would you, would you use? Right? You could use direct detection because direct detection will tell you no photons here and then some photons for the alpha. You could also use homodyne detection measurement because you can homodyne measurement. You could do the, you set up your homodyne to measure along this axis and you'll get information about the about the mean value. Um, if you use a BPSK modulation, which is called binary phase shift keying, where information is encoded using minus alpha and plus alpha, so on every channel used, you're sending one of these two states. So as you can see, your photon number measurement, will that be useful? Won't be, won't be useful, right? Because you're, you have both, both of the pulses have the same photon number. So energy measurement is not useful, but homodyne measurement will give you information. Um, whereas if you have some higher order constellation, like say phase shift king constellation, here homodyne measurement will again not be useful. Because you will not, you'll be able to discern between these two or these two, maybe these two, but if you set up your homodyne to measure along this quadrature, you won't get any information about this one. So you'll need to use heterodyne detection measurement okay, to get both the quadrature and both, both the quadratures measured. That was a very quick introduction, uh, but now I'll go into the real stuff about global communication. So um, if you had any questions about that part, um, I think this would be the time to ask. Sure, go ahead. Okay. Did you mention anything about quantum power? Is it important? 
sorry, quantum parallelism. Quantum parallelism. Um, that's a, okay. So that actually goes back to that's a good point. That goes back to I did not call this out separately, but I consider it as a part of um, uh, part of superposition. So um, just to expand on the point that Ivan just mentioned. <coughs> Because um, you can have superposition states, right? You can also prepare superpositions of an arbitrary number of qubit states. Okay? Meaning that you can, so if you have say n qubits, you have two to the n possible values those qubits can take, right? So a, a register, a quantum register can carry, carry arbitrary superpositions of all those two to the n sequences. And when you feed that into a, into a quantum processor, that entire quantum state evolves together. And that is what people refer to as parallelism. So that's a good point. Um, so, but it's a, it's basically a superposition at a larger scale. Sorry. So, in commutation, you make the same thing with and here D is uh, much less than 1. Mm -hmm. Is it far here? Yes. The relationship with the lambda does look like a, when you have a, a larger uh, lambda, then it drives you. Yeah. It drives you more into the far field. Yeah. Yep. Talking about uh, what's smaller uh, lambda. Um, that's uh, so. Those are very good questions, and we started thinking about those uh, when Mark started his program. So just to give you some numbers, if I can recall them, just with the um, so with uh, say a 1550 nanometer wavelength is the telecom band. Um, if you use apertures that are roughly around so 10 centimeters wide, okay. Oh, and uh, over, say, uh, between a kilometer to ten kilometers, you are already you are you are still in the near field domain. So it's not so. It, so that's one thing that when you you think of far field, it seems like the, for near field it seems like you have to be in a lab to be in the near field, but it's not the case. And um, on the other hand, you can very quickly you go into the far field when you increase the distances or you decrease your aperture sizes. Meaning, for instance, um, the uh, um, uh, if say with um, 10 centimeter diameter apertures, 1550 nanometers, um, it will be around say 20 to 30 kilometers when you will be at that d equals to one boundary. So if you go to 100 kilometers, you will be deep into the far field regime. So in that regime, you will definitely just want to use one spatial mode. So you then, at that point, using these OAM modes or multiple spatial modes doesn't buy you anything. But in the regimes that we were looking at in the info program, we were still in the uh, near field regime. So we were contemplating using multiple spatial modes that have all have very good transmissivities. More questions? Okay, so let me move into the reliable communication part. So this was the work that we did in the info program. I'll start with, again, a very quick review of information theory. And again, stop me if you, if you have any questions. So the first concept in information theory is the entropy, a random variable. So if you have a coin, you toss the coin, comes up head with probability p, comes up tail with probability 1 minus p. One toss of a coin, how much information did, did it give you? About, so I, I toss a coin, I hide it in my hand, okay? And I, I open my hand and I tell you that I got heads. How many bits of information did I just give you? So now if you're a coin, you knew a priori that the coin had heads printed on both sides. And I opened my hand and told you I got heads. How many bits of information did I give you? Zero, right? And uh, if the coin was, um, had equal, no, heads and tails on both sides and I tossed the coin in a fair way, then by revealing the outcome, I gave you one bit of information. So what Shannon quantified in a very meaningful way is um, when P is somewhere in between, what is the amount of bits, of, how many bits of information does that revealing uh, action carry? And it's given by this binary entropy function, minus P log P minus 1 minus P log 1 minus P. And it's not just for binary. If you have, say, some random variable that takes K values, each one has some probability distribution, you can write down its entropy. Okay? All right, so now, I'm jumping ahead very quickly, but I'll try to be, I'll try to describe this as well as I can. Um, now, let's say you have a noisy channel, and just let's look at this picture for a moment. You're sending 0 or 1 at the input of the channel, okay? And with probability p, your channel flips the bit, okay? Now, what Shannon tried to answer the question is that how many bits of information for use of that channel can I send that can be reliably decoded at the output? So if you think about it for a moment, if P were 0, 
every use of the channel can be used to send one bit of information reliably because whatever you send gets gets there with no error. What what if what about when p equals one? How many bits of information can we send per use of the channel? Is it st it's still one, right? Because if p is one, you know that your bit is going to be flipped with probability one, so you can still send bits reliably. Okay. Now, what Shannon was able to sh show is that exactly how many bits of information can you send over that channel per use, and it turns out to be 1 minus the binary entropy. So you can see this is consistent with what we saw. When p is 0 or 1, this number is 0. You can send 1 bit. When p is 1 half, meaning the channel arbitrarily flips your bit, it completely randomizes your input, your number of bits you can send is 0. It's 1 minus 1. Okay. And what is the intuition behind that? The intuition behind that is the following. So it's, it's what you do is called block coding. So you look at n users of the channel. Okay. Over n users of the channel, you can send 2 to the n possible uh, inputs, all sequences of zeros and ones. So imagine the space of all sequences of zeros and ones over here. And uh, now I'm going to only um, uh, take a, a, so a small subset of all those sequences and call them my legal code words. So those are the only sequences this, and the sender is allowed to send on the channel. Okay. And let's say I pick 2 to the k such sequences. So k is nr. Now if I send 2 to the nr possible things, and let's say that you are able to discriminate those 2 to the nr possible things reliably, how many bits of information did you send? You send nr bits of information, right? If you discriminate four things, you send two bits of information. So you send nr bits of information, but over n users of the channel. So you send r bits of information per use of the channel. And what Shannon showed is that now when, when these sequences, let's say this code word u, this propagates through the channel, some of the bits get flipped. Okay? So what you can ensure is that if you place these, these code words out to the maximum possible that you can in this whole space, Okay. such that your decoder's job will be when the, this, 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 this is what you send, this is what you received, and you basically map it back to the guy who is closest to you in that space because you, the decoder knows the black dots, right? And what Shannon showed is that the highest value this rate can be, this number of bits per use, such that this decoder can always decode with a probability of error that can go to zero in the limit that n goes to infinity. All of that was very quick. But this is what Shannon's major contribution was. And uh, this is, I just described this for the binary symmetric channel. But for arbitrary in channels that can be described as a transition probability matrix between a set of inputs and a set of outputs, you can write down the capacity as the maximum of this quantity called mutual information between the input and output random variables. And he proved that that is a rate that is achievable for reliable communication. When you use code words with block lengths large, and when you use this um, minimum distance decoder. OK, so now. I'll go to uh, quant the quantum mechanics, the quantum part of it. So we, you all just, just saw this expression for a state that is a superposition of, the, of these uh, complete orthonormal set of states. This is called a pure state, which is basically a vector. You can think of these as column vectors. You can write the density, what is called the density operator of a pure state is just an outer product of this column vector and a row vector. So this is a matrix. And a mixed state is a mixture of pure states. The mixed state is a density operator, which is a weighted sum of the density operators of a pure state. The, and the entropy of a density operator is defined as the negative trace of rho log rho, which just turns out to be the Shannon entropy of the eigenvalues of that density operator. Okay. Now, the entropy of a pure state is 0, because the pure state just has one of these terms, and its eigenvalues will be just 1 and then 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. So the entropy of that distribution is 0. Just to give you a quick example, Go back to that optical example that we talked about, BPSK, alpha and minus alpha, two coherent states. Okay? The density operator of, the, of a mixture, of an equal mixture of these two states is written given by this. And if you calculate the entropy, the von Neumann entropy of this, it comes out to be this expression. So this is the same binary entropy function we saw in the previous slide. And this NS is the magnitude alpha squared. This is the mean photon number in each one of these states. Okay? And we'll come back to this expression in a moment. Okay, so now coming to another guy, Alexander Holevo, who basically generalized a, mo a lot of the work that Shannon did to quantum channels, where your channel um, is a quantum mechanical object. And uh, here I'm ta I have just listed a, a theorem by Holevo about how much information, how much classical data can you send over a quantum channel. So now a quantum channel is uh, described by a set of inputs. These are classical inputs. I is just a random variable. These are, this is a probability distribution. 
each one of these eyes are mapped to a density operator at the input of the channel. So this is a quantum state of your light mode, the light field that you're sending, that appears as another density operator at the output. And the receiver is a, just does a quantum measurement. And all of that, the act of choosing the state, transmission and measurement, that induces a classical input-output channel, kind of the ex example that we saw in the previous slide. And you can write down the channel capacity of that channel. Okay. Now the question is that did I choose the best receiver I could to achieve the maximum possible capacity. And what Holevo's, the question that he was trying to answer is that if I had, if I had made no restriction on what measurement I chose the output of the channel, what is the maximum capacity that you can attain with no assumptions? Like what is the best possible receiver? And uh, that answer turns out to be, looks, look, looks something very similar to the mutual information expression I had for Shannon, except for Holevo doesn't, um, his theorem doesn't tell you explicitly how to build that receiver. It tells you a very complicated mathematical formalism for that receiver's measurement, but it doesn't tell you how to build that. A part, a big part of our work uh, for info was to, uh, to think about those measurements. So just to talk, go back to the coherence state example, I just wanted to show you what's the, what the you know, gap between Shannon and Holevo with, without going into too many details. So let's say each one of your channel, each channel use, you're sending either an alpha or minus alpha. Or let's say alpha or minus alpha is what you're receiving in the output. So let's subsume any loss in that, okay? Now, if I use a receiver that can discriminate between alpha and minus alpha, the minimum possible probability of error that quantum mechanics ever allows you. That probability of error is given by this expression. This can be actually attained in principle by a receiver structure that was proposed by Sam Dolinar. Um, so let's say you use the Dolinar receiver on every single channel output. So you just, you, that receives an alpha minus alpha, it tells it's plus or minus, okay? Then what it does is that it basically induces a binary symmetric channel, the kind of channel I, that I showed in my, a few slides back, where the zero goes to one with probability p, one goes to zero with probability p, right? And the capacity of that channel we know is one minus the binary entropy of that crossover probability, okay? So you can feed this expression here, I get this many bits, you can send par BPSK symbol over the channel. Now one could naively assume that this is the best you could do. Right. If you send BPSK inputs, is this the best capacity you could, you could, you could ever attain? So remember that we are using the best possible receiver that you can build to discriminate between minus alpha and plus alpha. Turns out the answer is no. Okay. Turns out that quantum mechanics allows you to make measurements that are collective measurements on the entire optical domain code word that can get you, that can let you have a higher capacity. So. So for that, we can compute the Holevo capacity. It doesn't yet tell you how to build that measurement. The Holevo capacity comes out to be a different expression than this. And uh, just to show you the gap, you can just plot those capacities. So what I did here is that I took this expression, C1, plugged in this P over here, and I just divided that by the mean photon number per pulse. So what I have is the number of bits per pulse divided by the number of photons per pulse. I have bits per photon on this axis. And on this axis, I have NS. Okay, so this is C1 and C. This is Shannon capacity of the best symbol by symbol receiver. This is the Holevo capacity. You see that the Shannon capacity curve, this, this is the one that you get. This is the C1 over N sub S. And the blue curve is the C over N sub S. So there is no limit to the photon efficiency that you can get if you use an arbitrarily powerful receiver, even with a BPSK modulation. Whereas your photon efficiency caps off about two nats per photon or 2.89 bits per photon if you use this best symbol by symbol receiver. Now, how do you bridge that gap? Well, you have to make joint collective measurements over multiple symbols. And uh, I won't go into the details of these, uh, but there are some examples, and these are some papers where we wrote some of these results where you can actually come up with receivers that can help you bridge some of the gap between, uh, between the Shannon and the Holevo limits. The other thing you note here is that this black dot, this is what I'm plotting, is the C ultimate divided by NS. So remember that I assume BPSK modulation to write the expressions for C and C1. I didn't have to restrict myself to a BPSK modulation. I could use a QAM or a QPSK or some very complicated modulation. Turns out when your mean photon number is small, that BPSK modulation's Holevo capacity is extremely close to, the, to what you get with arbitrarily complicated modulation formats. So there's a big gap between these two that you can fill out with, um, you can start filling up with these receivers. One other comment I would make here is that these collective measurements, uh, these measurements where the main thing is that the intuition is that you, ha you have to make the measurement before you go to the electrical domain. So you're, remember this picture I had. So now each one of these black dots is a sequence of pulses, like alphas and minus alphas, right? 
and you still have the same intuition here, but your join detection receiver, it just lets you pack in more of these black dots in this, in this space. And uh, the reason it does that is because um, the, collective, if the, the collective measurement, so any quantum measurement has to add in some amount of noise that is unavoidable. So if you measure each one of them one at a time, and even if you did any you know, classical post-processing of that, you can't get the performance that you can get with Holevo capacity. So some pe people familiar with uh, um, soft decision decoding might just say that, oh, this just sounds like soft decision decoding. Uh, right, go ahead. Mm -hmm. How much is different from quantum detection theory received by Helston? There is the book 1985. Yeah. I don't know if you've seen yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I refer to that book almost daily basis, yeah. So, for instance, Dolan receiver was probably in all of key life, mm -hmm. but uh, you can also see some uh, other things that are not known. Mm -hmm. You can also see some receiver that are PPM as a member, cooking detection as well, non cooking. Yeah. So, that's, uh, okay, so that's a good question. So. How how well do you can you can you can you build receivers to discriminate between more than two coherent states, right? And that's a question that actually was one of the first questions we started looking at in this project. And it turns out that even when you try to discriminate three coherent state waveforms, laser-like waveforms, at the Hellstrom limit, actually I we should call it the UN Kennedy and Latz limit because those are the guys who actually found the measurements. And Hellstrom explained it very well in his book. But the YKL limit to attain that, it turns out that a dollinar like strategy where you use feed forward and coherent, state, coherent local oscillator does not work. And uh, I was not going to talk about this today, but um, we wrote, uh, wrote a couple of papers on what would that measurement look like if you really had to discriminate arbit an arbitrary set of coherent state waveforms at the quantum limit. At that point, you end, your, your receiver ends up looking like a special purpose all optical quantum computer. Um, it's a basically a quantum processor. and. Uh, one other important thing about that is that lin passive linear optics has its limit too. So in this plot, you see that I went from the C1 to this green curve here. The green curve here can be attained by a receiver um, like this. It's, a, it's an optical version of the, of the green machine that was used uh, early on to, by Robert Green to decode these reed muller codes in the elect electrical domain. It, you cannot surpass the performance of this line to the, all the way to the whole level limit if you did not have um, active elements like other squeezers and core interactions or other nonlinear optical elements in your joint detection receiver. So, so it's a really hard wall you reach after a point. So it, and it makes sense that right? you're, you're trying to extract, you're trying to get all the way to the quantum limit. So you might as well use all the manifestly quantum properties of the light to squeeze out every single you know, bit of information that you can. So the, if you're just trying to pack in as many of these black dots in the space as you can. Um, so yeah, the, the and the, because you bring up the Hellstrom limit, one other thing is that if I pick up these code words in this in these black dots, there are multiple measurements that let you go to the whole level capacity. The YKL measurement, the Hellstrom limited receiver is one, but there are many other measurements that will also achieve the whole level capacity. Um, so um, so in fact, uh, yeah. So th this is the yeah. So this is the maximum capacity that C ultimate that I wrote here. Um, this is the capacity expression. And the one nice thing about this attaining this Holebo capacity is that you can attain that capacity using just with laser light. You don't need any, any crazy complicated states of light like squeeze states or number states to achieve this capacity. All you need is laser light modulation. Problem, of course, lies in the receiver. You have to build this receiver that collectively measures your, your code words. Um, without showing you all the math, I'm just going to give, show you a plot here. Um, so this is, on this axis I have photon efficiency, on this axis I have what is called spectral efficiency. So remember the C of NS was the number of bits per symbol, per channel use. This is the number of bits you're sending per symbol divided by the number of photons per symbol, so that's photon efficiency. If I take the ultimate capacity expression over here, this is the C of NS, and then I plot it in this trade-off, you get this black line. So this is the maximum possible capacity, the max the whole level limit that you can get with a single spatial mode. This is just one mode I'm using, okay? And uh, in this picture, my color coding is that all of the non-black lines correspond to receiver strategies that we have a, a prescription that we can give to an experimentalist. It's a structured receiver. Um, direct detection or energy measurement is good in the high photon efficiency regime, as people familiar with PPM and direct detection, they already know. 
Um, heterodyne detection is good in the high spectral efficiency regime with high order modulation like QAM or QPSK, well known in the fiber optics world. But there is this gap between the whole level limit and the, and, the, and the limits that are associated with standard receivers. Okay, so um, in the info program, we try to go beyond this black line, and you need a multiplier on the x-axis, so you need parallel channels, so you can, if you want to go higher than this line, you need multiple spatial modes. And uh, I won't go into the details of, uh, of this theory, but there are some papers I've listed here. As I was telling Ivan, we, we looked into various different measurements. Um, that can get you to the Holebo capacity and some of these papers. So this, the paper that I just mentioned you is this PRA, the slicing receiver. So that one tells you what a receiver will look like optically if you had to discriminate between a bunch of coherent state waveforms at the quantum limit, exactly at the minimum probability of error. And we also found the first structured error correcting code that can provably attain the Holebo limits called the polar code and the associated decoding format. The last slide on my reliable communications part um, is uh, one thing I wanted to, well, I did not mention. So remember, in my first description of, uh, of information theory, I said that that rate, the channel capacity is achievable in the limit of infinite block length codes, meaning only when that little n goes to infinity can you pack in c, 2 to the n c number of black dots in that picture. What about finite block length? Because in, in a real life, you would never use an infinite block length code. If I only use a code, code, word, code word block of say 100, how many bits can I reliably send over per channel use? And this question was answered only very recently while we were uh, performing on the info program by a um, person called uh, Polyansky in MIT. He came up with a quantity called dispersion of a channel. So just like capacity of a channel, there is a fundamental quantity that you can define for either a classical or a quantum channel that is called the channel's dispersion. What happens is that when you're limited to a, min, a, a block length n, you, the, min, the maximum number of reliable bits that you can send is, is still the channel capacity, and there is a subtractive term. Okay? You use mi, this is a minus square root of v over n times this q inverse of epsilon. This q function is just the inverse of the Gaussian error function. Epsilon is the error probability threshold that you're allow, you allowing yourself. Meaning that if you say, I want 10 to the minus 5 bit error rate, and I want to use a code book of not larger than 100 symbols long, how many bits of information can I send per use of the channel if I use the best possible 100 length code? Okay. And that was the answer that was given by Polyansky, and we generalized that to the quantum domain. This is uh, unpublished, still, but this is on the archive, that we have an expression for the dispersion for the optical channel. And as you can see, this is, I just plotted an example for the BPSK case here. So see, this, is, this was C, this is, C, this is C1, this is C. This is the capacity in the dollar in our receiver. And in order to even barely start beating that, and, I'm, and note that I'm assuming the best possible cores available here for that block length, you're looking at a joint detection over 200 block code words. Right? It's huge. Okay, so that brings me to the second part of my talk, the, which is basically the third part is, um, is, is it's subsumed in that basic pretty much. How much time do I have, Mark? Fifteen minutes. Fifteen, twenty? Okay, that, that's good. Yeah, that, perfect. Okay. All right, so now we are going to switch gears and um, go into secure communication. So now for doing secure communication, we unfortunately need a little bit more information theory. Um, post-channel information theory. Okay. So I have one slide on information theory. We don't have to understand everything in detail here, but I'll try to explain as much as I can. There is still Alice and Bob, but now there is an eavesdropper, a third person in the picture. So Alice sends an input, say X. Bob receives Y, and Eve receives um, Z. And let's say that this is a classical discrete memoryless channel, so not yet the quantum channel. Alice sends something, Bob gets something, Eve gets something. In this situation, how many bits of information can Alice send reliably to Bob such that Eve cannot decode that information? If, you, if I remove the last part of my sentence, my question, then we already know that the information i of x comma y is, that, is the correct answer. It turns out that the correct answer for the question I just asked is given by the quantity called the private capacity of the channel, c sub p of this channel is this quantity that was proven by Cheezer and Corner, was first formulated by a person called Weiner in a paper in 1975. And uh, this is a 
well-known formula and you can calculate. There's a mutual information between a random variable that you put before x. It's kind of an imaginary random variable between y and then u and z. Okay, so now I'm going to ask a slightly different question. So now I'm going to let Alice, Bob, and Eve have a public channel to shout at, at each other however many times as they want. They can use the channel as much as they want. This is, a, this is aside from the actual communication channel, this just channel. So this red line is that public channel. With that setup, per use of that physical channel, how many bits of shared secret can Alice and Bob generate that Eve cannot get any access to? Okay. Eve, I, I don't want Eve to be able to get any of those secret bits. This answer is, even to this day, unknown. That capacity is not known, even for a classical broadcast channel, as simple as this. But what we know is a lower bound and an upper bound. And a lower bound is actually achievable by your strategy, by one of two different strategies, and you use one or the other depending upon what your channel is. So if you look at this one, this expression, it looks very much like the private capacity expression, except that the first term is the Alice-Bob mutual information. This is the information that Alice and Bob share. And you subtract off an inf amount of information, roughly speaking, that Eve has with either the transmitter, or in the other case, the Eve has either with the receiver side. And the reason between the difference between these two information is that which party's data do you actually convert to the key, the eventual key, is what determines whether you're using a forward reconciliation protocol or a reverse reconciliation protocol. Okay? And the best known upper bound is given by this quantity called intrinsic information, where you calculate the conditional mutual information between Alice and Bob, Condition on a random variable z prime, where z prime has been obtained after doing something to z. Okay, so what is that something? That something can be any operation that you can do on z to get z prime in a causal way. So that's called a kind of a squashing channel. So you have to optimize over all those channels. You calculate that mutual information. That's the best known upper bound to that secret key capacity. Now, for the quantum channel, if you have an Alice, Bob, and Eve, the lower bound on the secret key capacity is known. So it looks very similar to the classical case. An upper bound was not known until very recently, which we found in this paper that came out last couple of months back, um, which looks extremely like the, like the classical quantity. Um, and, uh, but in this case, the Eve is a quantum system. The Eve can be arbitrarily complicated quantum system. And we evaluated this bound for the lossy optical channel. Okay, so I think that was enough. Um, and uh, now um, coming to quantum key distribution. So we talked about secret key generation. People have been thinking about this problem for a quantum channel for a long time, starting with the BB84 protocol. And uh, this protocol does not really, you know, uh, until we found this upper bound, it was, it was not known what is the best you could do with, uh, with a, with for key generation or an optical channel. But surprisingly enough, the BB84 protocol's performance was already pretty much up to there. It was, it was a very good protocol. Um, so anyhow, so what are the main steps of a QKD protocol? So what happens here is that Alice sends something to Bob. Bob some day makes some measurements. They do something. And at the end of the day, they have some correlated random variable, A and B, right? They, you take that correlated random variable, and then they extract shared secret from that that is consistent with the worst case quantum adversary that may have been consistent with that propagation channel. How do you do that? Mathematically, what you do is that you take that correlated random variable pair, you associate it with it, uh, the entire set of density operators, rho AB, that could have generated that correlated random variable pair AB. From all of that entire set, you take the worst case one, and you you purify, you extend that to this eavesdropper system, and then you calculate one of these to reverse or direct reconciliation capacity formulas that I showed you in the previous slide for the quantum case, depending upon whether you are using a forward or a reverse reconciliation scheme, and that's the secret key rate that is achievable. Remember two things. This is again assuming you have the best possible error correction code, and this is a different type of error correction. This is a, this is a distributed source coding problem. You are doing a compression of a bunch of random variables that are shared between them and extracting a smaller set of shared bits that are secret. And the other thing is that this expression is only true in the limit that n is infinity. It's the same way as the Shannon theory. So if you have a finite block length, you get lo lower than that. Okay. Um, so this is the rate that is achieved by the BB84 protocol the, uh, in, a, in, a, in the completely ideal operation. The way the BB84 protocol works is very simple. Alice sends a bit either encoded in this 0, 1 basis 
or she sends the bit encoded in the plus minus basis. Okay. And Bob again makes a random measurement either in the 0, 1 basis or the plus minus basis. And after they do the measurements, they later on the public channel they announce which instances they used which basis for the measurement and the state preparation. And because it is post fact, Eve cannot have Eve cannot look into that measurement arc while you know this was so what happens is that Alice and Bob only take those instances where they use the same basis and they use that to generate extract a shared secret key. I'm shoving on the run a lot of things about what happens with Eve, but when you do the whole security calculation, the secure key rate calculation, you do that worst case Eve calculation that I pre mentioned previously in my slide, you get a rate that roughly goes as the proportional to the transmissivity of that channel, eta. Remember, eta was the transmissivity of the channel. So it's, and there's intuition should be clear that if, I, if Alice sends a single photon, then the single photon either can go to Bob or to Eve, okay? If Bob gets a click, again, I'm assuming noiseless detectors. If Bob gets a click, Eve could not have gotten that photon. So that photon's information is available to Bob. This would not be true if Alice used a two photons in board like a or a coherent state input. Okay, so that's why your rate is basically proportional to the how many, what's the probability of that photon appearing at Bob's end, uh, which is eta, okay? Now, there was another protocol uh, proposed by Grossens and Grandier. This uses coherent states with a Gaussian modulation, the same way as I mentioned in my communication part of the talk. It also achieves a rate in its ideal operation that looks ex exceedingly close to the BB84 protocol's rate. Although it is a completely different protocol, it uses homodyne detection, not direct detection. If you remember, homodyne detection and coherent states it achieves this per performance. And a coherent state sent on the beam splitter, it appears as two coherent states at the output. Okay? And the best known achievable secret key rate in the entire literature so far is given by this paper. It's a highly unrealistic uh, protocol, so I would never recommend building anything to do that. But this is a, the best known achievable uh, secret key rate. And again, as you see, this is not just a, some small constant factor above the Grossens grandeur or the BB84 protocols, ideal operation limits. So we thought, is there an upper bound okay, to, to the best protocol? And what we did was we found this upper bound in this paper that came out a few months ago using um, that squashed entanglement quantity that I mentioned, uh, generalizing the intrinsic information result. And what you see here is that the upper bound is basically a small constant factor times eta. And what it means is that your rate in any secret key distribution of an optical channel has to go as the transmissivity of the channel. And if you're familiar with fiber loss, the, the transmissivity goes as e to the minus alpha L, right? the loss in the fiber which means that your rate has to decrease exponentially with the, uh, with the length of the fiber. And when you put some realistic numbers for your detector efficiencies, dark click probability, and so forth, your performance drops from these ideal operation limits. But again, by a constant factor, you can still get a rate loss scaling, which is proportional to eta. And one other interesting thing that I'm not going to go into is that you don't need single photons to get that good rate loss scaling for BB84 protocol. You can do that by coherent states alone, but you need this trick called decoy states to fool the eavesdropper. I won't go into how that works, but this is this. The, the, if you don't use decoy states with a coherent state-based BB84 protocol, you get a rate that scales as eta square, whereas when you use decoy states, you get a rate proportional to eta. Similar thing happens for CB protocol as well. Okay, so now um, the, the last bit. So, okay, so that was what I said. If you just had a point-to-point -point channel between Alice and Bob, the rate has to go down exponentially with the distance. So is it worthwhile to even pursue quantum communication or secret key generation? Um, so the answer is that there is a way to get around these, this exponential rate loss scaling, but you have to insert center stations along the channel. One very naive way would be I would take the whole channel, split it up into n segments, and I put trusted nodes there, nodes who you can trust. Okay? And then you could apply our upper bound to the individual pieces and say that because these are trusted nodes, you can generate shared secret between each pair and then convert into a shared secret for Alice and Bob, right? That would be fine. But the question is, can you, can you do that with, trust, with untrusted nodes? The nodes that you can buy from somebody, just install it there, have it do its job, and still be able to get a rate, uh, rate loss scaling that does not go as exponentially with the entire distance, but goes more like this? And the answer is yes, but you need uh, quantum logic capable nodes like tiny quantum processors that are known as quantum repeaters. And I don't believe I have a time to go into how quantum repeaters work. Um, the basic idea is that it can, you first have to, Alice and Bob, have to generate shared entanglement first and then make measurements on their shared entangled bits. Okay. 
unlike the QKD protocols that I mentioned previously, where Alice sends something and Bob's make a measurement. So these are so, and um, in order to make that happen, you have to use this uh, operation called the bell state measurement or more advanced versions of those that can take multiple copies of entangled pairs and then hook, hook them up into one entangled pair between the end to end. Or you can have three entangled pairs and do something in between, a quantum measurement in between that translates these three entangled pairs into one three-party entangled pair. Such things can happen. You need a tiny special purpose quantum processor. And here I'll jump a few slides to a plot from a paper that we just put out on the archive, which is that one over here. We analyzed a particular repeater architecture, um, buildable using standard components, although you would need quantum memories. That is another thing that is hard. People are working on that. Um, here I'm using, so these individual plots correspond to how many elementary links I have. This capital N is the number of segments I I separate, I, I split up that initial channel into, right? And if you look at the envelope of the rate versus distance, so this is rate versus distance, what you can show is that the rate goes as a power law, some constant times eta to the s, where eta is the transmissivity between Alice and Bob. As you imagine now, as you can now can see that when, if you had no repeaters, you would be bound to that upper bound that we found, which said that the rate has to go proportional to eta meaning that S power law factor has to have one. And you can get a power law factor that is below one um, using quantum repeaters. There are many types of quantum repeaters that people have looked into. This is just one. And if you have uh, dark click probabilities in your detectors, that determines where your rate loss trade-off cliffs off. Okay. So your detectors have noise. If your channel has noise, then you go through this linear part of the rate loss trade-off, and suddenly your rate goes to zero. And that is where that happens is determined by your, your noise in the detector. So as you increase the dark click probability, you see that the envelope is not affected, but the individual plots, they're coming, going to a lower maximum range. And suddenly, after a certain point, when the probability of dark click goes very high, then your whole thing collapses. And the same is true when you have uh, multiple pair generation probability, and this is a problem. This is a problem problem of concern with people who use down converter sources for generating um, entangled pairs. And again, when this probability of generating two pairs uh, increases, your your higher number of elementary link plots they come crashing one at a time. So meaning that you really want a very good entangled source in order to uh, get this performance. And uh, then the question arises that, okay, so there are repeater protocols that can help you circumvent this exponential rate loss scaling. What are the classes of things you could do at those nodes that can circumvent our upper bound that we found? And are there classes of things that you can rule out that would never help you uh, build, a, uh, build a quantum communication system that whose rate loss scaling um, uh, can be attained without any repeaters? And one class of such things that do not help are untended, what are called Gaussian center stations. So center stations that are examples would be parametric amplifiers, phase sensitive amplifiers, you know, uh, squeezers, linear optics, and things like that. And we prove this in this paper that all such Gaussian operations are essentially useless for QKD, meaning that you can get the same performance you would have gotten by just having a direct link between Alice and Bob. So you can come at it from two different ends. So you have the best possible quantum processor that can do arbitrary quantum, quantum operations. With the bell set measurements that I analyzed in the previous slide, it is not a general purpose quantum computer. It's not universal, but you can still beat the beat our bound. And there are things that are quantum limited, but still don't work. So we are working on trying to get, get these two approaches to meet someplace and trying to find, find, narrow down the approaches to repeaters. Okay, so I think I'll go down to, oh, I'm going to the opposite direction. Let me go down to the last, okay, so uh, part. And uh, so this is just my sort of vision of a, what a sort of generic, generic quantum node might look like. When you set a network situation, um, a quantum node could have, say, different qubits and slots in the memory, and then a quantum measurement that could connect arbitrary pairs, or maybe three-way connections, and could do arbitrary small quantum operations between these to connect different pieces of nodes together. And you could imagine lots of different interesting problems with that. So, imagine, so designing a quantum um, repeater network, if I had, say, these six memories, so these little blue dots are the number of, mo number of qubit memories you have, uh, then should I have direct three links between Alice and Bob? 
Should I have put one repeater and have two links here and one here? Or should I have three, two nodes and you know, three different links? And depending upon what your maximum range is, your answer may be different. So when your maximum range is very little, you could actually want to have three separate links. Again, intuitively makes sense because these bell state measurements are probabilistic. So if you have a long range, that's when you want to use this. And similar things may happen in a two-dimensional network setting. If you have, say, for instance, one, two, three, four, five memories, if your range is too large, you may prefer this sort of a situation as opposed to this situation. And this, this actually is related to the classic problem of Steiner trees in network communication theory. Uh, what if you had two flows, not just Alice and Bob? So there's Alice and Bob, there's another two nodes, C and D. They're trying to generate entanglement or, or generate shared secret keys over the same network. Okay? Once, what are the optimal local connection rules at these nodes? What should they do? Like one could imagine that all these nodes could just cater to the Alice Bob flow, in which case you would attain that point, and C and D will get no secret communication rate. On the other hand, they could all act as to support the CD route, and you can get the RCD point, and Alice and Bob will not get any secret keys. And you can obviously you can time share between those strategies and get any point along this line. But we recently found this is unpublished work that you can actually beat that time stream. You can, you can have clever strategies that these interim nodes could do where um, depending upon whether they have global information or local link state, in, link state information that you can actually outperform that time sharing strategy. So lots of open problems in quantum networking. You can imagine multiple flows. You can imagine multi-path routing. Um, and uh, like what are the local rules of the each of the nodes is definitely not clear. Okay, so um, I think I'm really out of time. So I just have two slides on this, covert communication. So I'll, I'll just uh, take a minute to talk about this and then I'll stop. Um, so this is the last, strat last problem I mentioned. You want Alice to be able to communicate to Bob reliably, but you don't want the eavesdropper to be able to detect the presence of the communication. And the conventional way to deal with this situation is to use pet spectrum techniques. Right? You take the signal, you just uh, apply a huge bandwidth expansion, push the entire thing below the noise floor such that the eavesdropper cannot detect you. You can ask information theoretic questions like the kind we did for the previous two topics. Like what is the absolute fundamental limit in, at which you can send information that is perfectly reliably decodable by Bob, but absolutely not decodable, detectable by the ad adversary. And what we found is what we call this uh, square root law. Meaning, little, this, remember this little n, what's the number of modes, it's the number of channel uses. So if you have any amount of excess noise in the channel, not pure loss, any amount of excess thermal noise in the channel, Alice can send of the order of square root of n bits of information that is, gets reliably decoded by Bob, such that Alice remains undetected by the adversary. Uh, this is a paper that is in review right now, but we had we did some experiments at BBN uh, where we showed the square root law. Um, so again, here we have, so this is just a picture of what a quantum network might look like one day. Hopefully, you have trusted nodes, untrusted nodes, processor nodes. You could have connections between nodes that do not cannot talk to each other. On the other hand, for for reliable for um, uh, you know for uh, covert communications, one thing that we are uh, uh, we are currently looking into is that um, you may not just be limited to that square root law. Meaning that if your adversary is can be assumed to be unsure of his or her receiver's noise characteristics then a constant rate covert communication um, that is covert to a quantum, that quantum limited adversary might be possible. Anyhow, so I think I talked a lot. This is our members of our group. We have four new people who joined. So those, their pictures are not here, but we are um, at least looking for one um, full-time position for a senior experimental researcher. And we do summer internships every year. So if you're interested, please feel free, feel free to contact me. Thank you.